Hey, this is a quick little video on how to change your clutch plates and springs. The bike in this video is a Kawasaki ZX7J1. That being said, I believe almost all the clutches for this era of ZX7 are pretty much identical, so it should apply to them, as well as the fact that the basics of this video will apply to pretty much any wet multi-plate clutch out there, um, which is the majority of them. The wet multi-plate clutch is the clutch of choice by motorcycle manufacturers for the simple fact that it is the quietest and it also has the longest lifespan on it. You will find dry multi-plate clutches uh, on a smaller number of bikes and uh, certainly when you get into track bikes because there are performance benefits for the dry multi-plate clutch. Um, but chances are if you've got a street bike, if you've got a standard street bike or sport bike, um, you're going to have a wet multi-plate clutch in there. So as you can see, I've got my manual ready to go. Up here, I have my new clutch springs. Down over here on the left, I have my new steel plates or my driven plates. Over here on the right, I have my new friction plates or my drive plates. And as you can see, I've decided to go OEM with these clutch plates. There are a lot of great aftermarket companies, but in my opinion, uh, the large majority of aftermarket clutch plates are sort of designed for performance applications which is great if you're at the track and, and changing your clutch is something you do regularly. But in my experience in the past, having owned some old dirt bikes and, and gone through this whole aftermarket clutch plate thing, uh, I found that you, you got good performance for a shorter period of time and you, you had to change them more often. That being said, when I ride my street bike, I, you know, reliability and longevity are important to me. So when it comes to uh, clutch plates, I always go back uh, to the OEM parts. So here we are at the clutch cover. The fairing's already been taken off. As you can see by the little oil window, I've already drained the oil. One of the things I've learned to do with clutches is that I like to do them when I'm sort of about halfway through my oil cycle. I drain the old oil into a clean container. Then when I'm done, I put the old oil back in. I know it sounds like blasphemy. The reason I do that is that especially with clutches, whenever you're working around in your engine, Inevitably, you're dislodging uh, a whole bunch of uh, little bits of gunk that have kind of found a place to live in and sit in. Uh, when you take everything apart, inevitably you dislodge them, as well as when you uh, do the gasket and scrape the gasket off, you're going to get little bits of stuff in there. So the logic is I put the old oil back in, uh, I start it up, run it, warm it up, take it for a spin, run it through the gears a few times, and then I bring it back, uh, drain all that old oil out and put fresh new oil in. Uh, the logic again being that if there are any little pieces of metal or scrapings or little bits of the, the clutch dust that have, that have broken loose, you're trying to get them out of the engine and keep them out from uh, causing any wear on your engine. The first thing you want to do when you get in here, especially if it's your first time doing this, is just take a quick visual count of all the bolts you have to loosen. Uh, in this case, there's 10 of them. Um, but you want to look for something like possibly number 7 that's hidden behind a hose. There's nothing worse than getting all the bolts out but one and then trying to wiggle that uh, clutch cover loose. You can end up doing a lot of damage to both the bolt and the casing. Now that you have all your bolts located, you want to start loosening them up. Whenever you're doing something like this, you always want to refer back to the age-old tire tightening method. So you would want to start, let's say, up here and then jump down over here, move across to here, then jump up here and sort of work your way around the whole clutch cover in that fashion. The second thing I like to do is I like to go around and crack all the bolts first. The reason for this is twofold. First of all, in my opinion, it's the best way to uncompress the gasket to make sure that you don't get any little tears or rips in the gasket. The second reason is that if I'm gonna have a bolt, inevitably sooner or later, you're gonna, you're gonna come across a seized bolt. If I'm gonna have a bolt that's seized in there, I wanna know about it right away. That way I can sort of focus on it, work on it, and figure out whether I can get that one loose in particular and then continue. Uh, there's nothing worse than getting a whole bunch of the bolts all taken out and then coming to one that you can't do, and then you have to reverse course and put them all back in, especially if you've got your, your gasket unevenly cracked. Uh, you can cause yourself all kinds of problems and headaches. So first of all, go through, crack all the bolts first in the, in the typical tire fashion, and then go around, take a little bit, you know, four or five more turns out of it to loosen them up, and then on the third round through, I usually go through and remove all the bolts. The other thing I like to do is that when I'm taking the bolts out, I like to keep them organized relative to their position on the clutch case, as you can see here. The reason I do this is twofold. First of all, inevitably when you're doing mechanics, sooner or later you're going to come across or find an unexpected problem. So say for instance, I notice one of these bolts, uh, the threads on it look like they've been stripped bare. Because I've kept them in this order, I don't have to start going through and looking through 10 different bolt holes with a flashlight. 
trying to figure out which one has the strip threads in it. Like I said, inevitably, you always come across problems that you didn't expect. And the more breadcrumbs you leave yourself to work your way backwards with, the easier overall you're going to make your life. The second reason that I like to keep things organized like this is that you can see these two bolts here, the ones with, let's say, the excess amount of Loctite on them. Uh, these two bolts are shorter than all the rest of the bolts. And almost inevitably across the board with these casings, that's going to be the case. There's always going to be one or two bolts that are a little shorter or a little bit longer than the rest of them. And if you're not paying attention and you just toss them all in a coffee cup, when you go back to put that clutch cover back on, you're going to be ratcheting in one of those longer bolts into one of those shorter holes and not paying attention. And that bolt's going to bottom out sooner than you think. And if you're unlucky, you're going to snap that bolt head right off and you will be swearing up and down the walls at yourself. It is such a pain in the ass. If you're lucky, you're gonna be able to grab a pair of vice grips and be able to uh, grab on the end of that screw and work it back out uh, and just have to replace the bolt. If you're unlucky, you're actually gonna to have to cut it off. You're gonna to have to re-drill it, re-tap it, and get a brand new bolt. Um, so it just adds a whole lot of frustration to the process and unnecessary time. So, you know, the two reasons for keeping them organized, again, you uh, save time working back on problems and you save time not creating problems for yourself down the road. And if you end up in a situation where you can't rebuild the bike right away, let's say you, you need parts that you don't have and you don't want to leave the bolts laying all over the floor in case somebody kicks them, one of the little things I like to do is grab a piece of cardboard and then you can draw out the uh, a basic rough shape of the clutch casing or whatever part it is. Uh, you can even label it if you want to. And then just put the bolts in there in position relative to where they were and where they came off. And this way you can just toss it in a box off to the side and you don't have to worry about uh, losing the bolts or losing their position where they came out of. So here we are with the clutch cover off. Once you get all the bolts out, you then want to just work that clutch cover loose. It should realistically be able to grab it with your hands and just kind of work it loose a little bit side to side. Um, you may need to, you know, bash it with your palm just a tiny little bit, but you want to be as gentle as possible. The goal being, of course, is not to shred that gasket right close to your engine, especially if you're planning on trying to reuse it. So now you're going to want to go ahead and remove all these clutch spring bolts. You can see them here. There's six of them. If we change the angle, you can see the spring is compressed in behind there, behind the washer and the bolt. Also note that this last friction or drive plate is in an offset position in the basket. This is how it's supposed to be. There is actually a video out there of a guy doing a ZX7R where he puts this last plate in wrong. So that's why it's always a good idea to have your manual. As well, it's always a good idea to, uh, you know, intermittently take pictures before, let's say, you get to this stage. You take a couple pictures and that way, uh, when you go back to put things back together, um, again, you're leaving yourself breadcrumbs. Sometimes things, when they come apart, seem really simple, and then all of a sudden you realize they have to go back in a specific way. So it's always a good idea to, uh, to take those pictures so that you uh, don't have any problems when you're putting everything back together. Here we are with all the bolts and springs removed. Again, you're going to want to go around just like a tire, crack them all first to make sure you're not going to have any problems right up front, then take all the bolts out, remove all the springs, uh, at which point you're then going to want to grab this first plate. The silver plate you see here is called the compression plate. And you're just slowly going to want to pull them out. And all the discs are going to be in behind and they're all going to be free. You just want to take them out one by one and make sure that you kind of do it evenly. If they start jamming, just kind of push them in and wiggle them around. Be careful, but they should all just essentially slide out evenly. So here we are halfway through our process. Everything's been removed and we're ready to start putting the new plates back in. If we zoom in quickly on our clutch basket, we can see up here, these are the tangs on the actual basket that the friction plates lock into, meaning that your friction plates are always spinning with the engine side of the clutch. That's why they're called drive plates. And if we look down here in these little grooves on the shaft, this is where the steel plates lock into, meaning that the steel plates are always spinning with the transmission side, which is sometimes why they're called the driven plates. Either way, when you start putting them back in, just make sure that the, everything's sliding in. You want to always start with a, with a friction plate and end with a friction plate as, as your first and last plates. That's why in any kit you should get, you should get one more friction plate than steel plate. So you want to go ahead and load them all in and then put the uh, compression plate back on the outside, at which point you're then ready to start loading in your springs. So again, when you're putting in these bolts, um, you want to go around and do it like a tire. You want to start with the uppermost bolt, get that one in, just grab a couple threads with it just to hold its position. 
then put the bottom one in. Once you've got everything kind of stabilized, you want to go ahead and put the rest of them in. And again, take four or five goes around. You'll notice that as you turn these in, as the springs compress, they kind of compress all the plates into place. And just be checking to make sure that all the plates are even and they're seating nicely and that nothing's kind of jammed in on a weird angle. And as you can see, I have the last friction plate in the offset tang in the basket the way it should be. Always good to have your manual for that reason to check these things that might seem a little bit odd, but this is the way it's supposed to be. The next step is going to be to torque all these bolts up to whatever your manual says. On this bike in particular, the ZX7J1, these bolts are specified to 78 inch pounds, equaling 6.5 foot pounds. If you don't have your shop torque wrench, if you don't have a torque wrench for this application, the best advice I could give you uh, would be to go get one if you're going to continue to do things like this. After that, these bolts don't require a, a lot of torque. They, it's very, very little, as you can tell by the number. The fact that you can't do it with your typical uh, tire torque wrench uh, should tell you that. So it's, it's very light. You just need to snug the threads up. If you're not working with a torque wrench, the only advice I would say is just don't over tighten them. You just really need to get a nice, uh, a nice bite on the threads and that's it. The springs do the rest of the work, holding pressure on the bolts to keep them in place. So now that you have your clutch back in and torqued up properly, the next step is going to be to put the clutch cover back on. I always buy the gasket when I do things like this because you never know. And if you look at the bottom right hand corner of this picture, you can already see a problem here. Uh, if we zoom in, we can see that a little piece of the gasket has actually stuck to the engine casing. This is why you want to be careful when you're sort of wiggling that clutch case loose in the first place. And if we look over on the gasket side here, you can see that indeed it is a piece of this gasket that has been ripped out. So the thing about a little rip like this is that it's one of these kind of things that many people are tempted to reuse, especially if you obviously don't have the gasket with you. You know, it's 50-50 either way. On one hand, you could argue that it's on the outside of the bolt hole and the gasket on the inside of the bolt hole still actually looks pretty fresh and new and sealable. Uh, you might be able to get away with squirting a little RTV on there and uh, you know, you very well could be fine. The thing about it for me is that A, because this bolt is actually on the bottom of the casing, it means that there's going to be oil sitting on it all the time. If it was a, you know, a case where the, the bolt was up in the top of the casing and it really wasn't gonna have oil sitting on it, but literally it was just gonna be splashing on it from the spinning of the clutch, then you know it you know it could be something that I would be more comfortable getting away with. But in the past, I've learned that the thing about little things like this is that it'll be fine and it'll be fine and it'll be fine. And then one day on a really hot day, you're gonna pull out to pass two or three cars at the same time and you're gonna double downshift. The pressure in the engine is gonna spike and that's the moment when something like this is gonna blow out on you. And if you're lucky, you're gonna get home and everything's gonna be fine and you're gonna wake up the next day and see a little uh, oil stain under your bike and realize that you've got a leak. But if you're unlucky, you might discover it on the very next corner when your rear tire drives over the oil and jumps out from underneath you like a bull with a pepper up its ass. So you take your chances when you deal with something like this or try to reuse something like this. Again, I always buy the gasket because you never know. And for peace of mind riding down the road, knowing that everything's uh, sealed up properly, it's always worth investing a little bit extra to get the gasket. So here we are with the gasket off. It was a pain to get off. Inevitably, when you're scraping these gaskets off, you're gonna get little pieces of gasket and little pieces of metal into the inside of the casing. So if you're not actually in a, you know, a proper mechanics bay where you actually have a wash station where you can wash something like this out properly, the next best thing you can do is make sure you get a big can of spray oil and you wanna just start spraying uh, oil down these channels down the outside, running them down into those bottom reservoirs. And the object is to get rid of as much of those uh, little pieces of metal, little pieces of possible gasket. Give it a couple good run throughs. I like to dump it out onto a clean white paper towel. That way I can kind of see what's coming out, see how much I've got. I like to do that until it's pretty much spotless and clean and I'm just dumping oil out. So now that your clutch cover is nice and clean, you're ready to prep your new gasket. You wanna take out your gasket sealer and then you wanna put it on your finger and rub a very smooth, thin layer on both sides of the gasket. Grab a newspaper and do it on there because it gets kind of messy. And you don't need a lot. You don't want too much so that when the bolts tighten down, it's squirting into the inside of the engine. Once you do that, you wanna then take that gasket, put it up on the engine side of the casing, making sure that it's lined up in all the holes and any dowel pins you might have that hold it in place. 
at which point you then put the clutch cover back on and you can go and get your bolts uh, that are nicely organized and put them in. And it's important to note that on this bike in particular, those two shorter bolts that had the Loctite on it, uh, when I went back to the manual, it did specifically say that they needed uh, the Loctite because of their position in the engine. Another good reason to have the manual, it's uh, something that's easy to overlook, but it could end up with you driving down the road and having those bolts back out on you because uh, of vibration or heat or whatever. Once you get these bolts torqued up properly, obviously you want to put that oil back in. You can either put the old oil back in like I do, take it for a quick spin, run it through the gears a few times and then change the oil, or you can choose to put brand new oil in it right away and uh, do it that way. So that wraps up my video for changing the clutch plates and springs on your motorcycle. I really hope you got something out of this no matter what type of bike you're working on. Hopefully there were a few helpful hints and tips to help you along the way help you avoid creating problems for yourself. The truth is, is that this is not a super complicated or difficult operation. You do have to pay attention. You do have to torque things properly. But other than that, it's pretty straightforward. And if you're even reasonably mechanically inclined, you shouldn't have any issues doing this. Don't forget to put your oil back in at the end. You laugh, but I've seen it happen. Leave a comment, let me know what you think, and hit the subscribe button.